two things. You don't yawn because you're tired. You yawn to clean your tonsils. And the second thing is we are just coming out of the circadian dip, so I'm hopeful that you're starting to awaken again at this point. <laughs> OK. So I would like you to remember back to the turn of the new millennium. Year 2000, there was an excitement, optimism. Things were looking good. There were fireworks, parties. For my wife, Nikki, and myself, it was a good time. Our first daughter had just been born. She's here and feeling very embarrassed, I suspect. Um, and it was looking good. Um, now, at the same time during her pregnancy, she started to experience some interesting and slightly worrying symptoms in her legs. She was feeling a bit of numbness, tingling, some pain. Now, she's a general practitioner, and she she knew what was going on. But um, as a good general practitioner, she went through the process through the NHS to find out what was happening to her. And she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS. So she has MS. Now, MS, for those of you who don't know, it's a disease. It's your own. It, you attack yourself. It's a, 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 a disease where you wreck, basically, your nerve cells in your body. It affects your eyesight, your hearing, your swallowing, your speaking your arms, your legs, internal organs. It affects all parts of your body. However, for Nikki, the biggest issue was with her sleep. It was affecting her sleep. And this is really where my interest in sleep came from, where it was really kindled, because I'm now a sleep researcher. I work, I work at the other university in Lincoln, the, <laughs> the, the newer one, shall I describe it as. And, uh, and I'm a professor of sleep research. And that's what I do as my day job. But it started here with Nikki because there was, we were trying to work out, well, what do you do about your sleep? A, a lot of you, in fact, if you look at the statistics, at least half of you have struggled with your sleep at times in your life. A third of you would describe yourselves as maybe suffering from insomnia. These things are very prevalent. And harking back a little bit to previous conversations we've had, there are lots of conversations about sleep and lots of information about sleep and lots of mythology and stories about sleep. Now, we're here for TED.com. We're all signed up to this. I think we all understand the importance. Ideas worth spreading. However, for sleep, there are lots of ideas too many ideas. Lots are spread through conversations and descriptions and chats in the pub and all sorts of places. However, they are to some extent possibly incorrect. They may be dangerous. They may not be helpful at all. These ideas that aren't worth spreading. So I've really called these grandma.com. <laughs> OK, these are my two grandparents. Grandma.com, stories that you'll have, you'll have heard. One hour before midnight is worth two hours afterwards. I don't know whether you've heard that one. Teenagers are lazy. They sleep too much, a classic. Um, how about the idea that you must wear your socks to bed? <laughs> or equally, the opposite, you mustn't wear your socks to bed. OK, grandma.com comes up with all these ideas. And so Nikki and I, we started looking at these, these mi myths to do with sleep and the evidence around them. So I'm going to talk to you about a few of these. We'll start with a classic. OK, coffee, caffeine. Who here drinks coffee? Most people. OK, you're not unusual. In the world, per day, there are 2 billion cups of coffee drank. 2 billion. It's exceptional. Huge number. Now, caffeine enters your bloodstream within 15 or so minutes from, from taking your first sip of coffee. It stays in your bloodstream for between five and six hours. Uh, until half of it is, re is removed, but it uh, hangs around for a long time. It affects your heart rate. It stops you from sleeping, potentially. Now, the government has a whole host of information about drinking coffee, and it says in there's a, there's a, um, a publication called Sleep Hygiene, or about sleep hygiene, and the idea is you look at your behavior and your, your environment in relation to sleep. And it suggests you don't drink coffee in the evenings if you're struggling with your sleep. OK, so Nikki. Right, I'm going to stop drinking coffee in the evening. Didn't help. 
Right, okay. I'm going to stop drinking coffee at lunchtime. Still didn't help. Okay, even though I like coffee, I'm only going to have one coffee in the morning before, the rest of the, before I go to the rest of the day. Still didn't help. So she gave up coffee entirely, and it worked amazingly well. And the reason we know is because then every now and then, accidentally, she'll, she'll ask for caf uh, decaffeinated coffee, for example, in, in a, your favorite coffee shop, and they don't do it decaffeinated. And then she's wired all day, and that evening's a nightmare. And I, uh, as her bed partner, I can, I can say it's a complete nightmare. <laughs> so coffee, we, we've got this idea that coffee is completely fine, but actually the, there are potentially some serious implications, and maybe we shouldn't be thinking just give it up in the evening. OK, other myths. Right, light is very important. I mentioned the circadian rhythm. You all have a rhythm of your ho hormones and your uh, physical properties of your body, and it's called the circadian rhythm it, around the day. So it's daytime, nighttime. And your body needs to know where it is at any one point in the day or in the night. And one of the major ways it does that is through light. Now, of course, your body has no idea what an electric light is. Your mind, your brain knows what electric lighting is. That makes sense. However, your body hasn't got a clue what's going on. So when it sees light, it thinks, oh, great, it's daytime. I'm going to wake myself up. And this, this is a, a photograph of the LED lights. I don't know whether you have them on the road near you. Very bright, very white light <coughs> contains a lot of blue what light, which is really what your body reacts to. And we have to be really careful with light. So again, going back to Nikki, sh we decided you have to really blot out all light in the bedroom so that it, you really, your body doesn't get fooled into thinking it's daytime again. And the reality is you can't just pull a few curtains across your, uh, across your window. You need to completely blot out all light, and that will then potentially help. Now, a favorite myth of mine. I, I've, I've done a lot of work on myths. I'm up to 57 myths. There are so many myths. This is one of my favorites. It's the cheese dream myth. OK. <laughs> I don't know whether anyone's experienced cheese dreams. I have. Two nights ago, I ate a pizza not quite close to bedtime. And I had the most amazing dreams. It's brilliant. So it's quite a positive. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, even though it sounds like a joke, there's been some real important actual actually real research on on cheese and dreaming and nightmares but i'm going to share with you one study this was a study conducted by the british cheese board i didn't <laughs> i didn't make that up okay the british cheese board they represent the cheese manufacturers and they gave 200 people a piece of cheese before bedtime and the following morning asked them what they dreamt about now what they found was Blue cheese. If you want to dream, surreal. Think <laughs> Salvador Dali. You need to eat blue cheese before bed. You'll have some great dreams. However, now, if you want to dream about your favorite celebrities, uh, this is my mother's favorite celebrity. I suspect she would quite be quite happy to dream about, about him. Cheddar, that's what you need to eat. The British Cheese Board says cheddar cheese will give you lovely dreams about your favorite celebrities. Now. All of these myths, we're going, going through these with Nikki for many years, and we're looking at all the different types and ways of dealing with them, the evidence and the research. And through all this time, actually, she's a lot better than she was. We've looked at all these myths, and they've, she's managed to solve her problems and sleep much better. Her well-being is much improved. But um, in the talks I give, a lot of people come up to me and they say, but Graham, how do I design my best night's sleep? So I thought I'm going to share some ideas with you, and one particular one. Because the reality is, we are all different. And we know we're all different. Of course we do. There's huge diversity. But in terms of sleep, we are all different. Every single person here needs a different amount of sleep every night. I can guarantee that not one of you will need the same number of hours or minutes per night. It'll all be slightly different. Some people will want five hours a night, quite short sleep. Margaret Thatcher, for example. Um, you might need nine hours sleep, maybe even 10. M it, much above 10 or 11, you're starting to think there might be some underlying reasons for this. But we're all different in that sense. In terms of the, your best night's sleep, you look at your environment. What's in it? Is the light coming in? Is, there, is it quiet? Is the temperature correct? 
Is your bedroom used? And this is, seems to be a theme. Is your bedroom used for sleeping and sex? Um, what about your behavior? Do you drink coffee? Is it inappropriate? Do you eat at the right time? Do you have a very good regular pattern? So we're all different. And the reality is you need to, if you're struggling, you need to look at your own environment and behaviors because there are no simple solutions. For example, the government saying drink no coffee in the evenings is not a solution for a lot of people. You need to look at it yourself. But I'm going to leave you with one solution, thing that you could try if you were interested in trying to improve your sleep. So what do we do? Every evening, we're often sitting out in our lounge, maybe lying on our sofa, maybe watching some television, reading a book, listening to the radio, having a chat. The, the lights are dim. You might have some candles on. It's lovely. Your body's thinking, great. It's becoming nighttime. I'm going to produce the hormones for sleeping. I'm going to reduce the hormones for activity. Everything's good. What's the Often, what most people they then do is they go into the bathroom with a very bright light <laughs> and they clean their teeth. OK, activity, exercise, light. Your body, they're going, ah, I've just produced all these hormones and stopped these. I thought I was going to sleep. Turns out I'm waking again. Right, back to activity. So you stop this sleepiness in its tracks. And so with that, I would just like to say, um, if you wish to sleep better, you need to think very clearly about yourself. There may be some things you could choose to do. But anyway, I hope you sleep better. Thank you very much. Okay.